storesupply.com is your one-stop shop for all your business needs. Whether you're starting... Well, hello everybody. Welcome back. Uh, I'm Scott, and we have Caleb here with me tonight as well. Say hi. Uh, hello. It's great to be here. Um, hopefully, you guys can hear us all right. Uh, I'm going to pop out the chat here so we can see the text chat. Okay. Looks like everything is good to go. Well, Parbellum was kind enough to send us all of the new releases for the uh, Sorcerer Kings today. So we have everything that's releasing in Wave 1. Uh, this does not include anything releasing in Wave 2, so we don't have like the Rakshasa or anything like that. But, uh, as we get started, everybody that's uh, here, say hi in the chat, let us know where you're from. Uh, and let us know whether or not you're excited for the Sorcerer King's army. So personally, I'm pretty excited for Sorcerer King's because uh, when they did the last project and we had the chance to vote on a couple of the different army factions, this one caught my eye right off the bat. Um, mostly just because of where they're from yeah. and the demographics of it. You don't see this a lot in miniature games. I agree. I've not seen very many Middle Eastern themed armies. Uh, it's kind of a fun theme. And and honestly, I was, in my mind, I was thinking more uh, kind of like Middle East up towards the uh, Siberia type direction. Like they were going to go with like a Mongolian theme somewhat. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was kind of surprised to see the Indian theme. And um, But I can say I'm really disappointed. Their models look great. And uh, I think the lore is pretty good. So I just realized I forgot to put on the background music. So we'll have to... Uh... If it's too loud, let me know and I'll just drop the uh, volume of it. In fact, I might drop it a little bit anyway, just to be safe. Yeah, I'll I'll say that I was a little disappointed with the Sorcerer Kings when I saw their models, just because I was expecting a little bit more of that... Uh, I don't know, for some reason I kind of expected a bit of a Chinese aesthetic to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's what I was kind of leaning towards too. Because um, in my mind I was thinking like camel rider riders and you know things like that, but... But I'm not like I'm not sad with what they did end up going with. Oh no, not at all. Uh, especially the Ifrit; those turned out really nice looking. And I think that's one of the fun things with the way they did that release, uh, just kind of like teasing everyone with like ideas and pictures. And for example, things like Dogs of War, um, I didn't really know what to expect from them. But so later on, when I started seeing more of what they were going to be, they were a little more exciting than they were initially. Yeah. So I'm hoping we still see them in the future, but. So I'm kind of just looking through the uh, sprues right now, starting with the uh, the goals. These are the goals right here. It's interesting that they're on such small sprues. Uh, we didn't actually get the boxes with these, so I'm wondering if these come in those, you know, those square boxes that trolls came in? Oh, yeah. I'm wondering if this will come in something like that, or if they're still going to come in the normal rectangular box. Well, and that's, that's pretty close to the new character size box, too. That's also true. But, uh, yeah, this kit's just three very simple sprues. Honestly, they're really cool. Here, take a look at one of them. They honestly look a lot more detailed in person than what I expected based on the pictures we saw. I'm noticing their, uh, their clothing's a lot more ragged and kind of quickly thrown together than what you could tell from looking at the, the artwork on the website. I do like the detail on the, the hands that are holding, like, the flames. Those look pretty good. And yeah. I actually really do enjoy um, painting flames. Once I learned a couple of the tricks on how to make them look good, it's, it's kind of a fun project. It, it comes together pretty quick. Yeah, I'm excited for the flames. Um, I'm doing a bit of a challenge. There's a community challenge going on where we're supposed to... We've been assigned different magic types. I've been assigned Toximancy, which is like manipulating toxins and poison and stuff. Mm -hmm. So for me, I'm going to be doing like bright green flames. I'm going to try. I've never done them before. So it's going to be a bit of a painting experiment. Is this part of your monthly paint challenge through the... 
miniature manager group or so is this, a, this is a uh, this is one put on by Lions Pride Creations uh, oh. the same guy that did the colors of thunder challenge last oh, okay. summer yeah so it, it should be pretty cool um, we're doing the magic themed one this time around because you know sorcerer kings and magic and all that I really need to get into the habit of setting aside time for like one or two models a month that I could get in on some of these challenges some of the challenges are easy to do, and others are hard. This one, I think, is going to be a pretty easy one. Um, so now I'm looking at the uh, the Rajakur. These ones are also really cool. I'll hand you a sprue as well, so you can oh, look yes. at them. First thing I notice right off the bat is that there are three copies of the banner. So you're going to have these extra flags, which are going to be... I'll probably use them for terrain. Oh, yeah. If you were to make like some tents or buildings for these to go on, it would be pretty cool. And the shields on these are really cool. Mm-hmm. They well, the shields and the armor look really good on these. They kind of remind me of, I don't know if you ever played the Monster Hunter World video game, but there's a, uh, one of the end game bosses gives you armor that's kind of in the style of these guys. Mm -hmm. And it's got kind of like a, a rose-colored gold tone to it. That's kind of what these shields remind me of. I really like the, uh, the chainmail sculpting on these. Mm -hmm. Probably my favorite chainmail I've seen on a model for quite a while. And their weapons look great. Um, oh yeah, the little maces, little maces and flails and things like that. Just um, I think it's really fun. I like I like just to see some variety in the types of weapons we're bringing into the game. But um, I will say this is probably one of my favorite mainline infantry kits I've seen in a while. And so if I ever do get into Sorcerer Kings, I will be uh, running quite a few of these, mostly just because of the looks. And I've really been yeah. uh, debating... So I think I'm getting into this army. I've been debating picking up that five-year anniversary starter set. And if I do, I will... Combined with the stuff that Parabellum sent me, I'd end up having nine stands of each of the basic... Um, each of the basic infantry units for the army right off the bat. And that's a pretty hefty number of models to paint. That's 36 models for each squad. <laughs> And the hard part is these guys have enough detail. If you wanted to take your time, you could make a superb army as far as looks go. Oh, yeah. But I, you know, I could see, like, you, you, you'd you be putting your time into these, though. Like, I'm excited for the uh, the Ifrit, which I'm holding right now. Um, <laughs> they're probably... So they've designed the Ifrit in this army to be, the, be able to replace the mainline infantry of the army, which is one of the cool things about this army. Like, the Brutes are your mainline infantry. And so they're going to have profiles that make them as defensive and as kind of damage bursty as you'd expect mainline infantry to be. And it also means that you're, you're going to be able to take a whole army of pretty much just straight brutes if you want. Mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking I might actually pick up maybe five boxes of these so that I can build an all Ifrit army. I'm definitely building around the fire theme. The sculpting on these is really cool as well. There's a lot of fire. Uh, the squad I'm building tonight is probably going to be the uh, the fire caster, the flame caster variant. I'm excited for these. Oh yeah! Now they shared a image of the elephant coming out for it. The the mahout. The mahout, yeah. Didn't they or? They did. Okay. Um, and that one's going to be interesting as well because the mahout is not going to be a a living elephant like we expected. But basically they said that one of the characters in the army has this thing where he's trying to sculpt a statue, like a golem, of the elephant that he used to ride into war that has since, you know, passed away. And I guess his statues have yet to turn out right, and so he just gives away the failed attempts to, like, visiting nobles, and hmm. he just uses them as his, like, his white elephant gift. Yeah. Quite literally in there, yeah. And so they're, they're actually statues, which I'm not crazy about. I kind of would have preferred an actual elephant, but, uh, you know, I'll take what I can get. It is unique. So this model that I'm looking at now is the Sardar. It's one of the character options for the army. This is like the character that you would use if you were building a non-magical, like, infantry-based army. Mm -hmm. Um, And I hate to say it. Oh, there's his head. Aha. Uh -huh. I was going to say, he's not, he didn't come with his head, it just was hiding. Yeah. Uh, he's so pretty, a shy fellow. Pretty fancy looking little dude. I mean, all of the, uh, really all of the, the characters in this army look cool. There weren't any characters that I didn't think looked 
just awesome. And I like how he's, uh, instead of wearing, like, a full cape, he's just wearing, like, this partial one. Mm -hmm. That just goes over one shoulder and then wraps around. Well, and one thing I appreciate, too, is how the cape's kind of uh, floating just a little bit, making it a little easier to paint underneath them. That, too. Yeah, that'll be nice. Hadn't thought about that as much. I like how much fabric there are on the characters, and even the infantry. They've got big, huge uh, gambesons underneath all their armor. Mm -hmm. It's going to mean that you can put a lot of color on this army. Which mine are going to be a bit, bit interesting, because of the... My color scheme is basically going to be gray, green, and black. Mm -hmm. Maybe a bit of gold and silver mixed in there as well. And so it's going to be kind of interesting. Okay, this is probably my favorite of the characters here. Um, this is the Maharaja. And this is the one that also has the alternate uh, convention exclusive mini, which I do not have, but I, I'm going to get it eventually. Break off that little nub there. I like this guy because he's kind of, his helmet's literally on fire, or his hat is. And he's got kind of the big uh, Middle Eastern turban type hat going on, which is really fun. He's also got these, just he's, he's entirely decked out in robes, so he's going to be very colorful. Uh, and then the back of his cape, he's got these awesome like details that would kind of, they're probably meant to represent embroidering on the cape. Yeah, he's gonna be cool. And yeah, there's there's a couple different ways you could get that embroidery to pop a little bit. And I'm not gonna take his staff out of the bag just because it looks kind of brittle. Um, but there's a staff, and it's on fire as well. That's gonna be fun. If I can get back in the bag here. How many people do we have watching at this point? We are up to eight. So, moving on to our next character, the Ra... Raj? Raj? I don't know how it's pronounced. But, uh... He... He's pretty cool, too. He's kind of like a... Aesthetically, he's like a midway point between the sorcerer look and the kind of soldier look. He's got, like, the chainmail face covering in the front. Looks like he's got scale mail on his shoulders and arms. And then he actually does have a breastplate as well. But then he's also got this big fireball that he's uh, getting ready to throw. I think that's the arm it goes in? Yeah. So he'll end up kind of sort of something like that. Kind of cool. I'm noticing that a lot of these uh, character models have a lot of uh, flash from the molding process. So I have to spend some time cleaning those up when I get around to building them. But that is another plus. I've noticed their flashing normally doesn't leave too many marks. Like, it comes off pretty clean. Something that I thought was cool about the characters, I'm grabbing all their cards right now. So obviously the Sardar, because he's a uh, non-magic character, he doesn't come with any additional cards. But the other characters come with art cards to represent their uh, their rituals that they can cast. Okay. So, I think that's a really cool thing because that, now you don't have to worry about picking up additional um, army support packs. You can just get the, the spell cards you need with your character. And on the back, they're just normal conquest cards. But the artwork's really cool on these. Intrusive Thoughts is going to be interesting because it's getting changed. Or rather, the mechanic that it inflicts upon people is getting changed. It was it gives you bloodlust, which before would make it so the unit had a chance of being forced into a charge. But I guess people weren't a huge fan of the mechanic, so the mechanic is getting changed, and now moving forward it's just going to make it so you can't retreat from combat. In my opinion, not quite as useful, but I understand the negative play experience that came from the original wording. Mm-hmm. So that's that one. That's the Maharaja's cards. And I think it's, it's you know, I don't envy the the rules designers that are trying to come up with those balanced spells and things like that. Because anytime you have a spell that affects an enemy unit, and it's going to come with mixed results. 
I thought. Uh, what was that one art card there with the sword? Was that, that one's called uh, safe? Oh, okay. Safe? Uh, yeah, or sa safe? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that was just a cool picture I saw. It was like, was it as you're flipping through them? So those are the ritual cards we have for now. I'm sure. As uh, I'm interested to see what they do if they release more rituals later on. If those will just come in the army support pack, or if they'll like repackage the characters later on. And I guess we should look at the cards for the other units. The Rajakur, Rajakur right here. The goals card's kind of fun. The artwork on that one's pretty nice. And you don't realize when you look at the models, but they do actually have pointed ears. And then the Ifrit. Very cool, all around. Okay. Well, with that in mind, why don't we start uh, actually building our model here, like we said we were going to. So, are you going? You're going to be assembling the Ifrit today, correct? Yes, I'm going to be assembling the Ifrit. Do you think you're going to go for the Flamecaster or the Sword Dancer variant? This first unit's going to be the Flamecaster variant, just because I have uh, that paint challenge to do, and yeah. I want to do a model that has more fire on it. And the Flamecasters have big fireballs that are thrown around and juggling between their hands. Yeah. Whereas the sword ones only have a little bit of flame on the ends of the swords. So for the sake of that, I'm going to go with the Flamecasters. Uh, rules sheet's pretty straightforward, it looks like. It's a big fold-out piece, so it's going to get in the way of the camera and stuff a little bit, but we'll work around it. We're, we're not going to do the basing on these tonight, though, because I honestly don't know what I'm doing for my basing yet. I haven't given it that much thought. I might just do it sandy and just leave it simple. I do notice that the backs of all these pieces have numbers, one, two, and three, so that you can get through clipping out the bodies faster. That's pretty convenient. I'm still going to try building it with the numbers, just to see how long it takes. Now let's see if we can get some uh, questions in the chat, spark some conversation. Maybe some paint ideas for them. Or lore questions. We'll try to do our best with the lore. I'll confess I'm not as familiar with the lore on this army as I am with some of the others. Because they are newer. And honestly, until maybe a few weeks ago, I wasn't planning on getting into this army. And then I just decided one day that they looked fun. I was playing in the list builder and built an all a free list and was like, oh, this would be fun to run. The growing pile of shame is getting painted. Good job, Wes. <laughs> now, Wes is uh, he's one of our bolt action players if I'm thinking of the right Wes. So he's probably working on some sort of historic games. I would assume either World War II stuff or I know he was working on some American Civil War miniatures the other day. But yeah, so I mean, like you were talking about the lore on these units a little bit where, and just them as a faction you know, like a lot of the different factions are really tied into the fall of the Old Dominion. And that's a real good, like, start point for a lot of lore, honestly. Y you can just kind of, you know, here, here it begins. Yeah, I kind of yeah. consider the uh, the Sorcerer Kings to be kind of the, the third member of what I call the uh, Old Dominion Trinity. Yep. So you got the Old Dominion themselves, and you've got the Sorcerer Kings and the City States. And each of them kind of take a different aspect. The actual Old Dominion is, you know, the Old Dominion. They have the religion of the Old Dominion and all that. And then you've got the city-states, which took, like, the science of the Old Dominion. And then, of course, the Sorcerer Kings, which took all the magic and arcane knowledge of the Old Dominion. Mm -hmm. Well, and I like how um, they're kind of from that, like, southeastern region of the map. So they're you know, pretty far from the Hundred Kingdoms, and I, I did notice a footnote in the lore where it seems like they kind of disappeared for a while. Nobody really knew about them, and then they just started showing up again. But the 
I really do like how they did the mixing of the magic with the units because it's really blended and like we were talking about all the different units you can choose how you want to fight this army if you want to be more melee focused or if you want to be uh, kind of like straight into the magic theme but when I first saw them I was wondering if they were going to be just like a straight magical force like we wouldn't see a lot of you'd only see a few melee units basically to fill in the gaps but it seems like there's a good balance still yep I agree definitely a good balance um one thing I like about this army, rules-wise, is it's one of the first armies, in my opinion, where there's no question about, like, what the sub-factions are. I actually cut out the wrong piece here. That would explain why they don't fit together. So I did see one question in the comments here. Somebody's asking how many head variants we have for our Efreet models here. Oh, well, that's a good question. Let's take a count real quick. So we've got... Uh, one, two, three. Oh, I like that one. It's got feathers. Four. Looks like a two-part head, maybe. Um. Mm, so there's for sure four on this main sprue. Then on the second sprue, looks like two. So it looks like we've got six heads, from what I can see. Um, so basically, when you look at the box, three of them are used on the flame casters, and three of them are used on the sword dancers, and that's what you have. But you can mix and match. There's nothing that says one head variant has to be for one, you know, type of Ifrit. Mm -hmm. Kind of surprised there aren't more, though. They usually are pretty good about throwing lots of head options in these kits. I mean, six is still quite a bit. Yeah, like, well, because at least then you're looking at if you have six models, you're going to have six unique ones for sure. But, but And depending on your play style, you, you know, that might be all you get if you just want two units of brutes just to have them. And as we get this put together, we'll have to see how the arms go. I'm hoping that the arms are designed so that any arms can go on any body. But at a glance, I suspect that's probably not the case. So earlier today, I was kind of imagining how I would paint this army, and it, I had a weird thought of trying to do like all green. And I wondered, for example, like for the fabric, doing a almost black shade of green, and then just adjust it as it went around. Mm -hmm. uh, just given the idea that it's all made of one type of magical energy, I thought it could could turn out cool or it could turn out bad. Who knows? But I might experiment with that on some models to see if I could get a cool looking design doing stuff like that. I'm kind of stuck on the colors for the fabric on the models. So I know that I'm doing the fire, this bright green color. Mm -hmm. And I know the skin on at least the Ifrit is going to be like a gray, maybe with a slight teal tint in the recesses. And then the fabric, initially I was like, well, maybe I should do it black. But then I got thinking about my process for highlighting black fabric, and it'll basically just be gray by the time I'm done with it. Yeah. And so I'm like, well, I don't want the fabric to be a darker shade of gray, the skin to be a lighter shade of gray, and then green, and that's all there is on the model. Right. <clears throat> so I'm trying to decide if maybe there's a color that would still look good and fit with that Toximancy theme, but uh, would also pop on the model a little bit more so that they just look pretty when they're on the tabletop. Okay, those pieces are ready to go. I mean, just off the top of my head, like, some type of an orange seems appealing, or, um... Like, uh, maybe even just like a darker red. Red could be interesting. The orange, my initial thought would be to say that orange and green together might be a little too Halloween-y. Mm -hmm. I don't really want to go that way, I don't think, with the look. <laughs> uh, somebody suggested they think purple would be a great contrast. Okay, are we talking like a a deep... Like dark purple? Or are we talking like a lighter purple, like a pale purple? What, what, or maybe even leaning more into the kind of burgundy purple pink color? I don't know. What kind of purple did you have in mind there, Chunky? It's always weird doing these uh, these chats and knowing that like I'll say something and it'll be a good thirty seconds before our audience even hears it. So I am just using plastic glue for these tonight, I think. Uh, 
So far I haven't seen anything on them that screams use super glue. But like most of these streams, I'll get about halfway through and then I'll be like, you know what? I should have just used super glue <laughs> <laughs> from the get-go. <laughs> okay, now I'm looking for pieces four and five. It says he was thinking li uh, royal purple to a lighter purple. Okay. So not really in the dark range. I'm almost more of a pastel in a way. I'm almost wondering if maybe I need to make a trip to the local hobby stores tomorrow and go shopping for some new paints. Because uh, I've got my greens figured out, and I think I've got my grays figured out. But I was wondering if maybe I should go looking for some, like, different greens for, like, if I want to do any green fabric on some of the models, or purples. Because I have a few, but my selection's kind of limited. And I don't want the purple that I do on them to just look the same as the purple I do on, say, my old Dominion. Yeah. Or on my, uh, my wife's Wadroon army. Um, where is piece number five? Uh, what are you imagining for your, like, any metallic bits you might run into? I'm probably going to go with, uh, silver on this one. So I'll use, like, lead belcher, highlight it with stormhost silver. Um... There was a brief moment where I debated maybe trying to go for a um, silver bronze kind of look. Someone here we have, I find that the new Prince of Persia video game is a great inspiration for the colors of the Sorcerer Kings. I might have to look into that. I haven't actually played a Prince of Persia game in a long time. Oh, five's the piece, of the piece that I accidentally cut out earlier. That's why I can't find it. <laughs> Half of this stream is going to be me looking through the sprue, trying to figure out where the piece is at, <laughs> and then discovering that I cut it out ten minutes ago. Have you ever accidentally, like, clipped part of the model in the wrong spot? Like, clipped off a joint or something like that? Um, I've clipped off the nubs that help you line up the parts plenty of times. Mm-hmm. Or there are a few where the nub is like close to an important detail, and this the little clippers, even though my clippers are designed for this kind of thing, sometimes they're just too bulky and they cut off a little bit extra, no matter how careful I try to be. And then every once in a while I'll have a moment where I get carried away and I push too deep when I'm trimming off like the, the mold lines and the uh, plastic bits, and I'll end up cutting a chunk out of it. So, yeah, I've watched all these new releases coming out for the game. I'm kind of excited for some of the new units coming out. Um, I think the Spire's Leon Avatara is one that I'm looking forward to getting a chance to put together and paint. It does look really cool. Mm -hmm. And I think they bring a lot to the gameplay of that army as well. Uh, they kind of open up a... Uh, I mean, you already had a cavalry build in the... Centaur Avatara. Mm -hmm. But I feel like the Leonine Avatara are giving that cavalry build more options. Because they're, they're a ranged unit, right? They have bows. Yeah, and they're going to be... I think they're going to be the first medium ranged unit. Yeah, because uh, other than that, we just have marksmen and the... the uh, I can't think of the word. It escapes me all of a sudden. I only own one kit of them. Infiltrators. The Vanguard clone infiltrators? Yep, yep. yep. And... Um, Okay, but no, at together? first, uh, there's this thing in that with me. Every time I hear of a new model, like when I heard, like, the Leon, I was thinking, like, you know, a big burly lion-type character, a little more masculine than they turned out. Um, so, you know, just kind of unique there. But I'm still I'm still happy with how they look. I'm curious to see what the full kit contains. Okay. As far as, like, different options for heads and everything. This is slightly driving me crazy, but it is not immediately obviously apparent to me how this fits together. I think we're like might just be crazy. So we have another here from Agent Agent Dex says maybe like you mentioned earlier you could do the uh, Shara. How would you say that? Ish Shara Ish Ishvalda. Valda. That's a uh, monster from Monster Hunter. Okay. Uh, the armor color scheme from the Monster Hunter world: rose gold and white being the dominant colors. See, and I was actually commenting earlier that that's kind of what I picture on the infantry looking really good. Um, I just have to figure out how to do it. Probably wouldn't be too hard. Um, oh, oh, I 
feel like I they, oh oh did I get it? I'm so close. There's just a little gap there, so it's not quite like that. Uh, I have a question here. It says, do some of the connections seem small? I'm guessing like the like the connecting points on the model. Do they seem like they're small or don't have a lot of hairs um, to you? That's what I'm wondering with this piece I'm trying to put together right now. I might look at my instructions here a little bit better. It's not like small, like it's not brittle, if that's what you're trying to ask. Um, it doesn't feel like it's going to break on me. I'm just having a hard time figuring out where it glues together. So the flame should be angled this way. And the body, this is the front. So... Aha! Uh -huh. I found it! Found the connection spot. Okay. Quick glue. No, once once that's glued in, I don't think that's a thin connection point at all. I think that's, uh... Honestly, that's thicker than a pencil. <laughs> <laughs> and... Like, the way it kind of spirals up, I think you can't get away with, with uh, the plastic. Resin, I'd be a little more concerned, just because that that would be a strong pressure point if you ever dropped the model. Oh, dude, look, I did get it back in place on the first try. <laughs> like, now watch, I'll forget where it goes, and I'll spend the next ten minutes trying to find it again. Okay, there we go. We we're up to the waist on the guy so far. Set that over here. So now we're looking for pieces 12 and 13. Which looks like is this body here. After we get this first one together, I think I'm going to do the rest by looking at the numbers on the inside of the piece. I think that'll be faster. <laughs> Not that we're in a huge hurry. You know, I was just thinking we missed out on a great opportunity to do like an April Fool's joke here. Oh yeah, what what did you have in mind? I don't know. We could have done something like we could have grabbed a sprue from like Hundred Kingdoms and pretended it was with the. <laughs> <laughs> we just announced that we got some model that's not releasing till the summertime. Yeah, it's like here, it's... come come build some old Dominion models right. from the July and June release er, uh, time period. Well, I don't know. Even when we were going through the Sorcerer King stuff, <laughs> that's like a, that's just militia crossbows. <laughs> <laughs> Those are bone golems, not Ifrit. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> or we're, uh, we did do the build. We only did the base plates today. <laughs> like, no, we don't want to make our viewers upset. No. Um, Parabellum did a, a post today. Um, I thought it was funny, but I kind of worry that they might have made our, our Hundred Kingdoms player a little upset. Because they made a post announcing the you know concept art for the Hundred Kingdoms trebuchet. And if you didn't realize it was April Fool's Day, <laughs> like, that that one was almost a little too serious. Like, the last couple they've done have had to do with fish gnomes, and it's been, like, obvious that it was a, a, a joke. Right. This one, it was like, well, it could be serious. It could be a real announcement. <laughs> right. They've had so many people excited for the idea of siege equipment. So siege equipment's hard. Like, things like trebuchets and catapults, battery rams, I can fully understand how that's... Uh, part of a city siege but you know you get the smaller like like a scorpion or the larger ballista and things like that that you could use in a small field for targeting monsters maybe i mean we're seeing a little bit of that with the new chariot units coming out but i i also think they don't want to steal ideas that they have for other armies so for yeah. example when they push back a little bit on the the ballista or the scorpion type unit i think just remember it is in the city states so you don't you don't want it in every faction yeah, and I think uh, I had always said that it would be cool to give them like a like a stone golem that's mm -hmm. made by one of the uh, like the chapter mages, or maybe flesh out their magic a little bit more and use magic to introduce some sort of monster unit. But then you got the sorcerer kings who are all about elementals and stuff, and so it's like, well, we can't take their thing and give it to the hundred or mm -hmm. to the yeah to the hundred kingdoms. Well, and part of the appeal for the Hundred Kingdoms for me is also seeing the, um, like the man, like just a common dude, just like you got common man versus everything that they're going through here, and it's their ingenuity and their skill that they have to go through for it. Hey, we just got a new channel member, Tyler. Thank you for uh, becoming a entry level manager. You are awesome. 
I used to be an entry level manager, and then my card expired, and I forgot about uh, it. You used to be a, a middle <laughs> management. Oh I yeah, believe. it was middle management. And then you forgot to uh, renew it, but it's not like the end of the world. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but I uh, know it was just funny. It's like that one card expiring, just how many things like that messed with, and um. But yeah, there's there's other stuff we do. But. Oh, see, this connection went together nice and easy. Like, no fighting me at all here. So I see he says he thinks the chariots are going to be dope to paint. And, uh, yeah, I agree. I think they're kind of fun. The the only part for me that's a little weird is the connection between the chariot and the lion. Um, Where it comes out of the mouth of the yeah, chariot. Yeah, it's and like the tongue. And it's like it's really art, you know, artistic and it looks cool and everything. But in my mind, it's like I probably prefer just the wooden beam if I could. But I've seen a lot of... Uh people online comment that they're worried that it'll be brittle just because not only is the connection point between two pieces of the chariot, mm -hmm. but it's also between two bases on the chariot. And so there's not, like, anything else supporting the two halves of the chariot. Now, I would be curious, because of that, if there was a way you could um, transport it in two pieces and to set them together. Uh, for example, where it hooks onto the two lions if you don't actually glue it there, or... Um, what I might even suggest is actually just putting some type of base plate on them, our connector that I've permanently puts them together. Like a little movement tray with just two slots. So uh, Pascal here just, oops, I guess I keep that glued together, just asked if the uh, arms might be easy to magnetize. So what I would say, look at the design of the arms here. Let's look at the back side of the sprue. Take this arm down here. It's a little square nub that lines up with the body. I don't know if this arm this arm has three on it, so let's find one of the ones that's labeled as number one. Um, this one has a one on it. So it's got the nub here. So theoretically you could cut that nub off and then the corresponding nub on the body here could be a spot for putting a magnet. So yeah, it wouldn't be terribly hard to magnetize the arms if you wanted to be able to switch quickly between uh, flame casters and sword dancers. And I will say it's not for the faint of heart. If you have some experience with it, go for it. Um, but, uh, you know, as any conversion, be ready for a little trial and error. The first time I saw a an arm similar to that that worked really well, I watched a video where a guy was converting uh, killer cans from Warhammer. And he was using like ball bearings and round magnets and all sorts of things like that and he was coming with some pretty cool effects but you might end up cutting into the model more than you would expect but if somebody does do that um do share some pictures and concepts of how you did it in our channel because i'd be curious to see some of that too the only reason i don't magnetize usually has nothing to do with liking it or disliking it I just personally like having an excuse to buy more minis. <laughs> <laughs> right. Especially if they're ones I enjoy painting, which I think the Ifrit will be a case where I, I'm really going to enjoy them. I enjoy most of the brute models in this game. They tend to be, in my opinion, the most rewarding ones to paint. Mm -hmm. They're not as time-intensive as a monster, but they're not as uh, monotonous as painting a uh, bunch of infantry. So let's see a couple more comments here that we got. You know, and like I said, thanks again, Tyler, for joining us. It's great to have you here. Um, yeah, I saw that comment where it's, I'm not even sure if the chariot is glued to the lion. I'm about to look at a picture of that, and we'll revisit that here in a second. Um, yep, it probably won't be glued. Uh, it seems to be hovering when I saw the pic. Okay, yeah, so I'm about to look at that and uh, see what I think, too. Personally, I think it is going to be glued, and the reason I say that is because they said for uh, First Blood, you're just going to leave them on the stand, and it would be really annoying if you had to constantly be uh, like moving both stands separately. But I guess we'll see when it comes out. Um, it would also seem really odd to me to not have them be connected. I'm trying to look at which heads fit on this guy, because I'm not sure if I want to go with the one the instructions are saying to use. So the heads do not specify which ones are compatible with which body, which makes me wonder if all of them are compatible with each body. I'm like scrolling through my screenshots here because whenever they were doing the reveal, I had to take a quick screenshot because I didn't have time to actually look at it. Mm-hmm. 
I won't deny I was at work listening to it like it was a podcast. And um, <laughs> whenever they would like say show the new model, I'd look at my screen real quick, make sure I don't get caught. Okay, so I'm just gonna go with the head. The instructions say because there's not one I'm looking at and saying, oh, I definitely want to do that one instead. I was hoping there would be multiple heads with the fire coming out of them, but it looks like there's really only the the one that I saw with the flames coming out of the head. You know, funny enough, that might be one of the only units I didn't actually get a screenshot of. Um, I've got the ability to pull up pictures. I still, but I still remember it to a degree, though. And um, is, is it on the web store yet? Mm-mm. Oh, I didn't see it for pre-order yet. You could probably just Google City States Chariot yeah. and get your picture. But one of the main things I was thinking that I was going to look at, though, is just where that connection was. And I've seen people do some cool effects with, like, jeweler's chains. And uh, so if you wanted to make it look like whatever harness was on the, the lion pulling the chariot had, like, chains going to the chariot, uh, you could always put a little magnet there and have, like, just that little connector. It, it, that would just make it easy to take apart. If, if you had a joint, that was obviously going to be glued. But... Yeah, and where they said that the chariot is going to be on a, uh, like, it'll be on the double square bases, mm -hmm. even in First Blood, it's the first model where I think it actually makes sense to just permanently base it. Oh, yeah, I, I Fill I, I in totally the gaps. There. In fact, it might not be a bad idea to, um, like, even if you wanted to be able to take it out of the square base plates, um, to still find a way to connect them. But, but right now, I'm going to say, I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt and say that, they've probably played with this quite a bit on the design and they're making sure that it's going to be fairly easy to move around and work with. Yeah, it's definitely, they've been designing this. I think they've been chatting about it internally for a good six months now where they've been hinting that it's in development. Yeah, he is making good progress so far. I've, I've made sure I've kept him on task. So he's been busy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm making all this progress. Back, back to work, you. And you're just sitting here. Uh, don't, don't tell him that. I don't need to know I'm not productive. I'm get reading a, the chat. I ought to get a important. second camera for you so that uh, <laughs> people can see what you're working on. Yeah. <laughs> and then they can be like, oh, oh, Caleb, get back to work. Yeah, they can, they can just stare <laughs> at Caleb sitting here. <laughs> Looks like there's a piece I forgot to cut off here. I know I said I was going to be there painting some drones, but... <laughs> well, now you're just kind of droning on. Yep. <laughs> that reminds me of a story. No. <laughs> oh, boy. We don't want any, no. any so spire stories. <laughs> we were doing a uh, a live stream one time when we were setting up the mics and trying to get them, you know, all the audio ready and everything. And I was just sitting here and got bored of just saying testing one, two, three. So I just started telling stories. And it was funny because Scott kept cutting me off to change things. And I would have stopped the story. And uh, our our assistant that was here that night, he like he was a pretty vested in the story at one point. He's like, well, what happened next? <laughs> I was like, you gotta wait for the next test. You know? Yeah, we definitely have our fun while we're getting things set up, don't we? Mm -hmm. Hopefully our audio is good. Like, I did my best to test it before we started the stream, but uh, I discovered that the mic that I've been using for the last few months in all of our stuff uh, had a design flaw in it where they mounted the microphone backwards on the thing. So the the microphone's been facing away from my mouth for the last few months. And so that's why I've had well you've your audio has come in a lot clearer. So I switched the mic now. So in theory I should have a, a better voice tonight. And that is a note too if anything's too loud or too quiet let us know I got the soundboard here I can do some adjustments. So let's see, what's another unit that's coming out? Well, if the, people haven't guessed from my, my dronings here, I do like Spires. So uh, Desolation drones coming out are going to be pretty cool. With them. Um, oh, it says audio is very good. Good to hear. Well, like, there were one of the units when I first saw them, I wasn't really sure what I was looking at. Um, with, like, the reprocessing cannons and things like that. But I think they're going to be a fun unit to play with. And, like, narratively, they're kind of silly. I think they're fun. So, yeah, now that I'm gluing this arm on, this would be super easy to magnetize. Um, and honestly, 
I don't know if I'm putting this in wrong, but you notice how there's like that gap right there. Doesn't quite line up properly. That's unusual. I don't normally see that in uh, conquest kits. Mm. But I think once I uh, once the plastic glue does its job, it won't be as noticeable. He's also got a random hole in his armpit. There must have been a uh, little air pocket in the uh, plastic when they cast it. So we've been working on terrain quite a bit, and I don't know if anyone here has seen in the channel, Scott shared a picture of some lava terrain that we've been working on uh, in our chat. It's been pretty fun. Like, I'm, I'm happy with how it's been turning out, just for kind of an impromptu project we did. Haven't shown it off online too much yet. It was oh. posted on our Facebook page the other day. Yeah, that's where I saw it. Um... But they'll, the, you'll all get to see it once it's once we got the full board done. I think we're waiting for the uh, Dwegom terrain to come out before I do put that board on a stream. Because mm -hmm. it'll go really good with the, the mat we've got. And we make a couple more of the lava pieces and then get the Dwegom buildings in there. It'll make a really cool board. Yeah, the new clockwork hoplites. There's a lot of rules around those things with uh, with their characters they can go with. So I'm, I'm excited to see those in a play. And I'm curious to see how the city-state's uh, play style is going to evolve when a few more of these units are available. So I did notice that, speaking of like new city-state's units, um, Reese, Reese Rice, the Parbellum guy from, uh, from Australia, he confirmed that the Founders exclusive that's coming out is going to be an alternate Titan. Ooh, that sounds So it's going to be a big resin thing. And I'm assuming that uh, if you saw the image that was behind uh, Stavro during the Play on Tabletop live stream, he appeared for just a few minutes in there. And I think that concept art behind him is what it's going to look like. And if that's the case, it's going to be awesome. There's, yep, can't wait to see the lava board. I won't deny, like, it brought out the kid in me a little bit when we were working on those, because it was like, it was just fun to see, just like a simple little project, and it's like, here we go, we got a lava flow, looks great. It's a super simple terrain piece, it was literally just a piece of MDF with a, uh, bunch of, oh, the name has escaped me, corkboard, mm -hmm. corkboard over it, and we just cut pieces of corkboard so there'd be cracks, and, uh, then yeah, we just some different painting painted techniques. it. Yeah. So our first one's done. We finished it in... I mean, we would have finished it faster if I weren't distracted and, <laughs> you know, spending ten minutes looking for a single piece on the sprue that I'd already cut out. But honestly, this went together pretty fast, this first one did. Now, what I didn't do is I didn't pull out any other brutes for us to compare to. Um... What would you like? I can grab something. We got bone golems. We got these these guys here. Yeah, hand me the... Uh, uh, I think the best character. comparison would be the Old Dominion statues. The Old Dominion statues, okay. They're probably in my army box. Actually, they might be up... I don't know where the statues are now that I think about it. And we got some ogre. I got a knight. We got all sorts of things, but... There are I'll also my, my bukephali are up on top of the shelf in there, so... But we'll get some size comparison going here. But uh, that's the first one. I think these are really cool. I would say they're comparable in, like, their bulkiness is comparable to, like, the the Old Dominion statues. These might be ever so slightly larger. They'd certainly take up more of their base. Push this guy just a little bit further on his base while his glue's still drying. So here's two, just because they're kind of common models. And here's this. Whoop, nope. Sorry. There you go. Okay, so here we have it next to the, the statues. So yeah, I'd say. They're comparable. Yeah, and, you know, he's almost the same height as, like, this uh, knight here, too. 
slightly taller, but... And this night is all dusty. I guess I need to store him better. I'll hand you the night back. <laughs> You're all right. Don't pull from the dusty pile. What's wrong with you? <laughs> Get the clean miniature yeah. next time. <laughs> Intern's not doing too well. <laughs> Intern. <laughs> yeah. Is that what you are? Next time I say get a model, get it right. <laughs> yeah, these are cool. I'm definitely going to have to uh, build a whole army of them to counter your uh, your football team and your Spires army. Oh, yes, the football team. <laughs> oh, got to get that base plate. Okay. Yep, if anybody's... If they've never seen it, my brutes are basically... Uh, like the bone color and blue, so they re they really do look like a football team when I get them all on the board. So Tyler, you probably weren't here when we said it earlier, but I am painting this first set for part of a paint challenge. So the theme of the magic is going to be toxomancy, which is the manipulation of venoms and you know toxins and stuff. And so I'm actually going to be going with bright green for the flames on these, and then the skin's probably going to be a gray color, pretty similar to what I did on the uh, the Werewargs. That is an excellent question, Chonky. Which army would I recommend for somebody who's new to Conquest? So between the two that you're leaning towards, I'd say Spires are definitely going to be easier to, uh, to pick up and just jump right into. Um, Nords are fun. But they are kind of punishing if you're not good at planning where your units are going to go. Because they, they're they a very glass cannon army where they're burst, bursty, they do a bunch of damage, and then they just kind of die. At least in my experience. Um, I'm sure there's some people out there that would agree with me and some people that would disagree. Whereas Spires are kind of the army, they're kind of like... I'd say Spires are kind of like Space Marines where <laughs> they kind of have a solution for every situation. But I don't play the army. What do you think? Uh, you know, I like the Spires myself because a lot of the army's affected by the sport characters you bring. And I really like the Biomancer. I really like the Executor. And you can, uh, like you said, you can cater your army to the situation you're going to be in based on what you're deciding to do for play style. And uh, I, I try not to uh, like suggest play styles that are like counters to one thing because then you're kind of stuck in like one one play style but i will say there's a a couple of nord players i've went against and it does seem like they are particularly good against spires to me um uh just like on base unit stats for example like if you had raiders go against drones it, it seems like the raiders one up the drones pretty well once you get into the the brute range it seems like the spires start taking over a bit from there but Spires I, I are think also you would be happy with either or, really. Yeah, I would say Spires are also a fun army because they're probably the army that does healing the best out of all the armies in the game. Mm -hmm. um, I'd say healing is kind of like their thing if you go that playstyle at least. Yeah, <clears throat> and my throat's starting to die on me. <laughs> One thing I've noticed it seems like the, like if you're playing Nords, if you want to just have like a certain boost to your army, or you want to have just like an overall like. Let's just make their attacks a little better or their charges a little better. You can do that. Spires, you're going to have to pay a little attention to what abilities you use and when. And they don't really use magic. So, like, they're pharomancies and biomancies. Think of them more as scientists. And their their abilities are going to go off automatically most of the time. And when you're playing as Spires, you have to look at your units as currency. And your hit point pool as currency. You're going to be using that as you play the game. And... So for every action, you get a little bit of a reaction that's going to hurt you to a degree. But more often than not, it's going to come out ahead. But uh, the downfall, though, on the fact that you have these biomancies and pharomancies that are automatic, you can't do anything to combat or deny magic from other players. Um, so just like they can't stop you, you can't stop a spell. Or you can't interfere with a spell currently. And for me, that hasn't been that big of an issue. But whenever I get to play with armies that have magic, it is kind of a fun element to use. But... It's not normally too much of a concern for me. Spires are also just easy to paint. Since they all have that chitin bone looking armor, mm -hmm. you can kind of just speed paint them. Whereas Nords are probably one of the, in my opinion, one of the most annoying armies to paint because they all <laughs> have 
different designs of leather and yeah, they got the belts and the fabrics and they're kind of like painting orcs in 40k where there's not really any uniformity between their their models and so you're you're oh. gonna paint a lot more different colors. I re I remember uh, doing the batch painting of my orc boys for 40k and that was a project. Like y you look really cool when you got a fully finished army, but. Um, and, and as far as, like, metas and who's doing well, like, you'll you'll see each army kind of gets their moment on top. Like, I don't think you're going to ever buy an army and feel like you made a poor investment. And I also think that each army is going to be able to play a different play style. Like, you're not going to be locked into one. Like, if you bought Nords, you're not only melee infantry. You, you'll be able to mix it up a little bit. But, um, you know, just based on the units that are released, you'll see different things you could push for. Spires also have the advantage right now of being almost fully released. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, is there anything that won't be released by the... Uh, is there anything that's not been announced yet? Like that? Uh, yes, actually. the um, I think it was the Desolation Beast. And uh, actually, let me flip over to my handy-dandy Parabellum map is, here. Isn't there another monster unit? Uh, yeah, that's the, the Desolation Beast. Oh, I see. Yeah. So there's Desolation Drones and Desolation Beasts. Yes, and I think there was one more. Let's see. So we have the Desolation Drones. They're coming out this year. The Leon Avatar are coming out this year. So we're looking for Prowlers and uh, Terraphons. Okay. And a Terraphon is a medium brute unit. And it, it is going to have the fly keyword, and it's going to have a ranged attack. So it's going to be a really interesting unit if they keep the kind of what we see as the hypothetical stats here. I don't like to lock in stats for units that we haven't seen released yet, because you never know when playtesting or some idea changes. But I think the core concept of what you see is going to stick. Yeah. Um, his next question, though, about the box being a good price. Um, I, I heard you say okay, so I didn't want to cut you off if you noticed know something you want to talk about real quick. Nope, go ahead. Okay. Um, let's see. So I'm assuming you're talking about the fifth anniversary box, or I thought, see, I think he said. Well, if he's getting one of the starter sets and he's getting it this year, chances are it's the 5th anniversary ones. Yep, yep, he said that. And in my opinion, all the 5th anniversary boxes are a really good value. Mm -hmm. uh, now, how good are they in terms of playability? That's that's a good question. Yep. So, just because it's the army, I know better. <clears throat> I'm going to go through it first. So if you want the Spires one, you're going to get the Lineage Highborn build. And this is going to be a really good elite build for the Spires. The, the Avatar, even though they're the mainstay, aren't anything to be ignored. They are very strong units. And if you have this as your core, you can build any direction you want from there. Uh, a lot of the builds you're going to see for Spires go one of two ways. You're either going to have a larger mob of drones, or you're going to have a more, kind of more of this elite direction. But uh, the, the box itself is a really good value. For $160 on their, on their website, like, even I've been tempted by this one just to to build up that side of my army because when I started I went with all small infantry but the incarnate sentinels are like the ideal unit to me at, at first I didn't care for them too much but after using them in a few games it's almost an auto bring for me anymore they look cool they really <laughs> do and they were fun to paint um and it was really funny because at first these were models like in the spires range the avatar were probably one of my least favorite ones but, like, getting them and paint, putting them together and painting them, they, they're actually really well done, and they look really good. But I really did, um, I think it's because when I started, I really liked the marksmen and the drones, and I was liking the uniform look. Um, let's go look at that Nord starter box, though. See what they got going there. So while he's looking for that, I'm noticing with these models, they'll, if you're not chatting and being distracted, you'll probably be able to get these together really fast because really it goes in kind of three steps. It's how to build the, uh, you know, the bottom half with all the flames, and then it's a step for building the body, and then a step for throwing the arms and head on, and then you're done. So these go together really fast, which is good because I'm probably going to have five boxes of them, so I'm going to need to build them fast. <laughs> My phone crashed for a moment, so I had to reload everything. Uh, nope, you don't get to see the Nords today. Yeah, it says we don't like the internet no more. We're just going to call it quits. Yep, 
the thing about all the fifth anniversary starter sets, they basically took the normal starter sets, which are already a cheaper value than buying the models separately, and they said, well, let's raise the price by $10 and add a whole additional unit. And in some of them, they added, like, monsters, and added, like, a $100 retail value to the box and only charged an additional $10. Ah, uh, here we go. Okay, now I remember the Nord's 5th edition. So it comes with the Vargri Lord, the Fenrir Beast Pack, and three Werewargs as the kind of the main core of the army. You have a box of Uger, and Uger, they're kind of a middle ground. They're a really good heavy unit. Like, if you need something just for, like, sitting on an objective that doesn't cost too much point-wise, they're not too bad. I um, haven't seen a lot of good performance from Uger, but I think yeah. it's also because I think our players that originally had them kind of stepped away from them. Honestly, I have a box of Uger, and I've never had much success with running them. Either. And I only usually play them in First Blood, mm -hmm. and I've never been terribly impressed by them in that game either. Yeah. Uh, Werewargs are just a lot cooler, even though they're lights. Mm -hmm. Just my choice for Brutes, but that box comes with a bunch of them, so... Right. Um, and it also comes with Mount Jotnar. That, that seems like it's a staple for most of the Nords players I see. Yeah. And the only thing I'll say is if anybody's buying a monster-sized unit, don't be surprised if it gets targeted. So you don't get discouraged if you see it get taken out as, like early, because it is a scary model when you see it. Like, you you tend to target it when you can. The nice thing about Conquest is that because it's all through the activations and it has the reinforcement mechanic where things don't just start on the board, even when stuff's getting targeted, it's still a pretty good chance of doing something before it dies. Mm -hmm. Except for maybe when you're fighting Dwego. Dwego kind of focus fire and say, no, you don't get that toy anymore. <laughs> so, but yeah, so far most of their 5th anniversary boxes seem like they're going towards the, the more brute and large build. But, uh, there was somebody that came, he brought us uh, the Sea Yotnar to uh, battle. And that did really well when he was screening it just right. So I think that's another thing to remember with your giants. It's really tempting us to put them on the front line and run them, but you got to use them right still. Well, in one of the top lists at Adepticon, I can't remember if it was first place or one of the other two, but uh, they played a Nords list that had, a, I think, an Ice Jotnar and a uh, Sea Jotnar in it. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like it did really well. I mean, if it won, obviously it did well, but piloted well, Nords are rewarding, I would say. Oh, let me find the name of the unit. They got one of my favorite archers in the game. Even though I've only been on the uh, receiving end of the punishment they send out. Because I know they got two of them. So, it may be maybe the bow chosen. I'm sitting here looking at the heads on these Ifrit. And at a glance, I'm inclined to say that every head is compatible with every body, because they all have the same shape for the uh, the little nub that holds them in place. Bless you. And they seem to have the uh, the same general like positioning around the base of the neck. So when I build additional ones, I might have to experiment with doing more variety of heads. And then I need to I need to test the arms and see how compatible the arms are. I'm assuming they're not super compatible across different bodies. Sorry to <coughs> kind of change subject on you there. No, no, you're good. Had to turn my mic off for a second so I didn't sneeze in everybody's ears. Well, I still heard you, but I'm in the same room, so <laughs> I don't know if that counts. What else was there? So, I don't know... So, like, if you can still get the kits, if anybody's ever looking at things like the First Blood kits, for example, um, those are also a really good value. And I've seen things like the Spires ones. I've thought about getting them just to beef up some of my units a little bit. But, um, like, dollar-wise, you're, you're getting a good return for those as well. But if you're buying into the full-size game right off the bat, um, I would save something like that for further down the line. Or if you just want to get into, say you wanted to do First Blood with another faction, 
So let's say you wanted to main Spire so you get your 2,000 points for them and then get just like a little 800 to 1,000 point army using that for the Nords and play some First Blood with it. And I think that would be a good way to go. See, and I think that the First Blood starter sets are kind of like a a taster to mm -hmm. give you a taste of the models in that faction because they don't really... Like, you can play a game of First Blood with them. Yeah. But uh, they don't really give you, like, a full army. You're You're going to have to still buy a bunch of other kits. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. But like it's you you could get that and then like a like a box of infantry and get pretty close. I do like the city state one, the one that's currently out. Mm -hmm. Um however, they're all getting replaced here pretty soon. Mm -hmm. I don't remember what month those release. Maybe they've already released and I just missed it. Well, the city states one was in an interesting spot because you could end up with a full unit of um like say hoplites and then it comes with a monitor so you would have one more so if you were running those as auxiliaries you would basically have one more unit to add to your army yeah and, and another character it's the only one that was like playable in last argument like if you wanted to put it over in last argument it was a full unit yeah yeah um, i hope they do that more with future first blood starters because i think that makes them useful mm -hmm. well in and then the main reason theirs worked is because of the dual kit that the infantry were. You you could build it either way, and you could you know you could do the flangites or you could do the hoplites and end up with a full unit. But I I've heard that they might start stepping away from dual kits a little bit. Um, I don't think they're going to go away completely. But they talked about it with more of an interest of making sure that all the units look unique. And yeah. personally, I think that's a good idea. Well, and if you look at the uh, sorcerer kings as a good example, they uh. Sorcerer King's kits are none of them are dual kits so far, except for the brutes, which are just two of the same variant, like two variants of the same unit. So you asked Pascal if uh, the first blood kits come with square bases. As far as I know, they do. So you can still use them. In last argument, the thing with most of the first blood kits is that they only come with basically one stand of each of the units that come in the kit. So you're using them to expand your existing units rather than like adding a full new unit to your last argument army. Yep. <clears throat> and um yeah, and that's where we were just saying like if you if you're a city states player, it's definitely a great jump in. But like if you are if you already have some models for the larger game, then you could go that way, but that would just be one of the only things to be cautioned on. Um like if you get the Spires box and you end up with one box of inf I mean one unit of infiltrators then you need to have at least three to run them. So you would end up buying a full kit of them anyway. But uh, Another thing I could see somebody doing is if they wanted to buy a character but they wanted to get a little extra with it, um, that wouldn't be a bad way to do it if it had a character you wanted. The, uh, the Sorcerer King's first blood kit's really interesting because uh, the Sorcerer Kings are the first army to not have any retinue models. And that's because retinue models are kind of being phased out and replaced with new officers. And as a result, they instead made it so that your characters, depending on which character they are, they can summon brutes to be their escort. So like the uh, the Maharaja, I think it is, gets to take either Flamecaster or Sword uh, Dancer Ifrit as mm -hmm. his escort. Which is a super cool idea because it's like a... It's not the same kind of force multiplier that the, uh, the retinues were but it's still a force multiplier that's making a character unit just ever so slightly more of a threat. Look at that. That guy looks good. He, he looks like he's trying to deceive you. <laughs> he's like, hey, I've got a fireball for you. You want it? And then he throws the other one at you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, so I saw a guy asked if... Uh, he says the painting tutorials for this is going to be on fire, basically. But um, do you think, is this going to be one that you're going to be doing sooner for the channel, you think? Or do you got some oh, other yeah. projects going? Um, so I've got another tutorial that just needs the voiceover. That's a Sister of Battle tutorial. I actually finished mm -hmm. it like two weeks ago, and I've just been delaying put uh, uploading it. Mm -hmm. But uh, once that one's uploaded, this is the next project I'm working on. So the tutorial for these guys... If things go well, 
could be as early as this weekend or as late as like middle of next week. Mm. Ideally, this week is going to be largely focused on getting product reviews for all the kits up. Um, which product reviews only take an hour or so to get thrown together from start to finish. And then the paint tutorials. So this is mm. Sorcerer Kings are going to be pretty much the only thing I work on for the next probably two to three weeks. Um, so there'll be a lot of tutorials, but this will, the Ifrit will definitely be the first one I do because I want to do that painting challenge with all the other content creators that are participating in it. Which then and as a community, if you guys want to participate in the, uh, magic of conquest or the colors of magic or something like that, just be sure to look for it because there will be an announcement by Parabellum, I'm assuming pretty soon on that paint challenge. And it'll be just kind of like when we did the Colors of Thunder, where people that participate in it will enter their their paint jobs. And then Parabellum will judge them, and I'm assuming the winner gets some sort of prize. Or even just to communicate with the community. I mean, I'm not saying Parabellum wouldn't do a prize, but sometimes even just reaching out and sharing your work with people is a little bit fun, too. Oh, definitely. Well, we're starting on our last Ifrit, and we're only an uh, hour and 15 minutes into this stream, so these are going together pretty good. Not going to be like our stream with the uh, Tontor, where we spend five hours working on it. <laughs> Talking about old movies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was funny, because I talked to one of our people that were uh, that, that viewed that, and they were like, yeah, I was right on the edge of my seat hearing you guys talk about the shows. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh... Well, and I definitely like this format of having two of us here chatting while we paint or build models because it's uh, it's easier to keep it entertaining. When I stream by myself, I'll often have, you know, two or three minutes where there'll be nothing said because there's nobody to talk to and nobody's commenting on anything in the chat. And that'll change over time as uh, as these streams get more attention, as we get more subscribers and stuff. Eventually, keeping a conversation going will be no problem. So on this last one, I am just cutting out the body pieces based on the numbers. I'm kind of just ignoring the instructions. Because they have these nice, convenient numbers on the insides of the pieces. There we go. Now I'm painting too, so. Good job. Do you feel accomplished? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> At the end of the day, I can say I did something. I painted the shields of some drones. Well, it's better than nothing. <laughs> and it helps us get our, uh, our demo armies up and running. For anyone that doesn't know, our uh, group, uh, we're going to be hosting a tournament in our one of our local towns here next month. Yeah, we do it as part of a tabletop, uh, it's a board game convention called Icon. And it's uh, it's one of my favorite events of the year. Uh, it happens twice a year, in April and in October. And this will be our second time running a Last Argument tournament at it. We have uh, 16 people confirmed with one person that's just waiting to find out if they've got the time off from work for the first day. So it's it's lining up to be a good good little tournament. Mm -hmm. And those players come from three different states. Next time in October, I'm going to shoot for trying to get uh, the Washington players over here as well. Because right now we've got Montana, Idaho, and Utah all gathering for this tournament. be great to get another batch of players in here. And this all just started with our little local group here in our hometown. And... We decided we heard about a tournament down in Utah, and we decided we'd make the drive down, met that crew, and then we went up to Montana and met that crew. So all these people that we've just become acquainted with over the years, and um, like we we don't get to see each other very often, but whenever we do, it's always a good time, and it's been fun to expand our community beyond just our town. Yeah, I agree. And uh, 
It's also interesting because, like, we get used to playing within our own group. You get used to the lists that people are bringing. And then you go out of town and you realize, oh, our lists, uh, they don't hold a, a match to any of these other lists that other people are playing with. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> like, uh, Andrew, who has taken third at both LVO and Adepticon now with his 100 Kingdoms, he's part of the Montana crew. And so we get to be regular, well, not regularly, but a few times a year we get to be schooled by them on how to uh, play the game. And I won't deny it was kind of fun when I saw the listings for the current standings in Icon and I saw Andrew was there playing. I got kind of excited and I was cheering You mean on. Adepticon? Uh, yeah, Adepticon. Um, but it was kind of fun. Like, hey, I know that guy. <laughs> <You> know? <laughs> so, like, you know, show him what you got. <laughs> but yeah. he's one of the only players from there I haven't got a chance to go against. That's because the last time we were up there for a tournament, he was hosting. Yep. And I think last Icon, you just didn't make it to those top tables. Nope. Last Icon was funny because I spent most of the time uh, helping set up the event. Like, I was I was completely expecting to be at the demo table, honestly. And yeah. then uh, the day of, we needed someone to fill in. And I had put some of my models towards the demo table. So I was like, well, okay, I'll, I'll make a list with what I got left. And then we had another Spires player that needed to borrow some. <laughs> and uh, so I was there. It's like, okay, here's the leftovers on my army. <laughs> um, you get to play with the stuff nobody else wanted. <laughs> uh, yeah, some of us get schooled by Andrew every week. <laughs> yep. <laughs> That's the thing that I like most about our crew up in Montana. They're all really good, and they, they'll kick our butts any day. Mm -hmm. But they're all nice about it. You don't come out of it... Unless you really, really get like crushed and you never stood a chance, you don't come out of the game feeling bad. Yep. And I can't say that of every competitive player I've met. Um, my first year that we went to LVO, there were a couple players that we met where y they were nice when you first met them, and then you started playing against them, and you were like, this just isn't fun. <laughs> um, I had, had one guy, don't recall his name, but... Uh, he told me through one of the games, I was saying, well, I'm just here to have fun. And he was like, well, I'm here to win. And he was mad because uh, that was before they had made the ruling that conceding, if you conceded, your opponent got to play out their turns. Back then, it was just conceding end of the game. And so I conceded when I knew I was losing because I'm like, well, let's save ourselves some time and be able to go get lunch. And he was upset because he wanted to score those additional points on me and I ended his game. <laughs> and I was like, well... Whether or not that was my intent, uh, was not my intent to make him upset. Yeah. You know, for me, at the end of the day, like, I have competitive moments. Like, I, I don't take it super serious, but there are times where I'm like, I'll put a little extra effort in. Like, anytime you and I fight each other? Yeah, Scott and I, it's funny because um, most of the times you've beaten me, he's been on camera. Oh. Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> if people are watching, yeah, I put my best game on. So, so nobody will believe me if I say that I'm like your better opponent. <laughs> but um, I never know what the outcome of our games is going to yeah. be. Like, it's always close. It's never a landslide one way or the other. We had a little, like, just a little casual tournament we did here one day, and our game was tense. Like, right up to the end, we were only like a point away from each other. But either way, when when I finish a game against a really skilled opponent i i appreciate it when um even if i lose that i still put up a good fight so at the end of the day if it's like i kind of held my own like i'm still content it's interesting to see how uh you can be really good at an army and then get absolutely crushed because uh another army's list just happened to counter you really well yes um there's never an army that is at least not with the armies I play. There's never a list that's going to win every time. Uh, not just based off the list, at least. Now, there are some Dwegom lists that I think, as long as the player piloting them is at least semi-competent, they will win most of their games, maybe even all of them. Um, those have been getting nerfed down quite a bit, but I do think they still exist. One of my favorite... Um victories actually was against a Dwegon player uh, two years ago it was when the double drake build was super strong and uh, I managed to beat him at OVO and he seemed a little shocked 
honestly, when it, um, like right after the game, and I think it's because um, he was a little too reliant on the list that he had. That was but at the end of uh, right at the end of first edition, right right before yep. second came out. Yep. So it was kind of when it was at its strongest. But what he didn't know is one of our local players was running that exact list, and we had been fine tuning our list for probably three or four weeks before we went. And so I fought that list plenty of times. So when I went there and saw it, it's like, okay, I'm not excited to fight this, but I know how to handle it. And um, it, it was kind of interesting. But it was one of those situations where it was just like, yeah, you, you just got to be a little careful if um, it's a well-known list. People are going to be paying a little more attention to it than others. It's kind of funny. Um, when a list does well multiple times in a row, and you're the player that piloted that list, the community kind of starts to blame you for getting their units nerfed. Um, yeah. <laughs> I think I saw that uh, in some of the Vanguard chatter on Discord, where one of the Vanguards was like, I had people come after me and say, oh, thanks for getting our Ash and Dawn nerfed. And he was like, but I wasn't even the 100 Kingdoms player that was piloting that list. <laughs> <laughs> okay, apparently this head has two pieces. Oh, yeah, there's a little... So this one has the, the flaming head. And it has a little snake head at the end of the flame, and the snake head is apparently a separate piece. So when you're building yours, make sure you don't forget to cut out the snake head. Unless you don't want it, in which case, honestly, you could probably make it look like it was never meant to be there to begin with. Every time I change the subject back to the model, we have a moment of silence afterwards. Are we mourning the previous conversation? <laughs> no, we, we have a moment of mourning while we... <laughs> See, there it goes again. Back to the moment of well, silence. It, it didn't help that I was also <laughs> trying to paint between the shield and the arm of this drone at the same time. <laughs> I think I'm discovering I need to... I need to get a camera mount that allows it to be a little bit closer to where I'm sitting so that when I do this I can be sitting back in my chair because right now I'm leaning forward I'm discovering that after an hour or so of doing this it's not as comfortable as I expected it to be maybe I'm just fat <laughs> <laughs> I need this geriatric camera mount here to <laughs> It just needs to be just a little bit further back so that I don't have to be leaning so far forward to have my hands in front of the camera. <laughs> uh, so a while ago, we had made jokes about um, we should all get a gym membership so our, our club can help support each other in getting fit. And uh, kind of forgot about it. And we had well, one of our members, his wife, was came over for her visit. And uh, she mentioned it. She's like, weren't you all going to get, like, a gym membership? Like, you guys need to be working out and stuff. <laughs> and um, I was here like, oh, no. <laughs> like, <laughs> Don't remind us. No, it's like. It's, <laughs> it's fun when we, uh, yeah. when we mention it of our own, of our own accord. Yeah, but, but when we're reminded like, of it, it's like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> weren't you going to go on a gym and a diet? <laughs> what are you saying? <laughs> She's like, it's close enough to New Year's. It could be your New Year's resolution. <laughs> I'm like, no, that's dumb. <laughs> Pick something original. <laughs> I don't even need a gym membership. My apartment complex has a gym. I'm just... I'm too self-conscious to go to a gym. I don't mind exercising. But going to a gym, especially a public one, means that everybody gets to see you being fat, lifting weights. And I'm not even that fat. I'm just <laughs> kind of fat. I used to go to the gym uh, with my dad a little bit. And um, my problem is I just get bored of like the workout routine. And then... I, like, I kind of agree. I just don't like to be in, like, the gym environment, I suppose. Like, yeah. I don't have any issues with working out, but. I, I feel like I'd much rather exercise through, like, a something useful. Like, back before uh, the pandemic, I did a lot of LARPing stuff, and that was how I got my exercise. You know, once a week for three or four hours, I'd be at the park swinging swords all day and, you know, 15, 20 pounds of chain mail or plate armor or leather armor or just costuming. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep, having a good balance in the meta as I saw that comment. He's impressed with how many different armies did well at Adepticon, I think. Uh, 
we have as good a balance in the meta as there has been. And a while ago, I was talking to Scott about, I think as more models release for more armies, we'll also see more options open up for people. And that's where kind of like that swinging pendulum of the balance will happen. And uh, we kind of alluded to that earlier when we talked about seeing the new city-states models. I'm curious to see how their play style changes just with some of these new options. I like that... Uh, so, being a, in on the playtesting and stuff, I get to see a lot of the... Maybe not all the process of de developing the rules, but I get to see a lot of the debating that goes on. And one thing that I've enjoyed is watching how the playtesting has changed since when I first got into it and now. Like, it's it's changed a lot. The biggest change is that before it felt like every tournament there was always like a, a wave of nerfs that would be discussed immediately after. Where it was like, oh, this tournament just happened and this thing did really good, so let's nerf it. But now it's kind of gotten to the point where it's like, let's watch tournaments over three or four months. Even the really big ones. Let's Let's watch and see how the meta actually plays out over time. And so they've switched to doing less rules updates, but having them be more impactful. Mm -hmm. And I, I really like that. Now, there are still small micro-updates that happen from time to time. We're always going to be dealing with that. That's yeah. not going away anytime soon. <laughs> you got to be a little fixed in, too, when you're a playtester. People aren't too happy when there's changes. Um, but one of the things that's unique... Um, because like anybody that's never done it, the one of the ways Parabellum does it, you do your reviews, you get all your information, you send it in, um, and they review it from everyone and make their decision. <clears throat> so more often than not, it's not just one person's test, uh, unless somebody brings up like a really good point, a really good question, then they'll share it with everyone and have you have a look at it from that angle and do some more testing. Um, but in the end, they, d they really do try to put in a lot of um, thought into their changes before they make them. Yeah, and even when you sometimes feel like your opinion maybe doesn't have impact, they, they are considering it. Considering it doesn't mean they necessarily agree with it, but at least they consider it. Mm -hmm. And with that, our third Ifrit is together. There you go. Now we just got to glue him on his base and... Well, I only got one drone painted, but it's done. <laughs> well, as done as I can get it at this stage, anyway. The timing of this is working out about how I expected it. I figured this would be a bit shorter stream. I'm definitely not going to build all the infantry on stream. Because uh, I'd probably spend an hour per stand. And we'd be here for three hours per each squad of infantry. Well, and infantry are interesting because... The first one's always the most challenging one, but after you've built one, one or two of them, you kind of, you don't even need the instructions anymore. You can just fly through the kit. And yeah. They're not as entertaining to watch though as they're being built. Oh no, no. But then, then There's, again, I don't know if yeah, this was watch. entertaining either. <laughs> There's that one viewer somewhere that's been let down. I'm like, oh, <laughs> I wanted to I, watch I him build. I waited through all the free <laughs> so I could see. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so like extra pieces that we get, looks like we basically got one head and two arms per Ifrit that are extra. Now the two arms are going to be for the alternate version, correct? So, like the sword dancer. Yeah, yeah. So the two arms are for the the sword dancer versus the flame caster, and from what I can see, the arms do have a little ever so tiny number in them to tell you which body they go to, so they are designed with the intent of putting them with specific bodies. Now what would be kind of fun is designing them where it has a sword in one arm and the flame in the other. Could be kind of a cool way to mix it up. Yeah, because then you could run it either way. Yeah, and I think most of the time, as long as you're communicating clearly to your opponent which one's which, mm -hmm. uh, people aren't going to complain at you. No. Well get these out here so everybody can see them all lined up and looking snazzy that is our Arfrit those are really cool I'm I'm really happy with the models um, I think I want you in the middle you look like the boss yeah there we go I like it 
they're going to be a quite a bit of fun to paint. And like I said, the thing I'm struggling with is the fabric. So like this guy's a good example. He's going to have the gray, slightly blue tinted gray skin. And he's going to have the bright green flames. And I am going to... I'm going to figure out how to do some of the lighting effects so that it looks a little bit more believable, I guess. I've been playing around with it on some test models. So lots of gray, lots of green. And then I just got to find a good color for all this fabric. And that's where I'm kind of stumped right now. And then you said you're thinking of doing like a sand texture around Maybe. the base plate? I haven't really decided. Uh, sand would just be easy to do, mm -hmm. especially across the whole army. And then with these guys that are on fire, a lot of the base is going to be green anyway because of the off-source lighting effect. And, uh, you know, I would be curious, like, if you were to put, like, a little bit of sand on it and then dry brush it with the same colors you're doing the uh, the flames underneath them. So it looked like it was still kind of, like, drying from around. Almost like a little bit of a whirlwind effect before it actually hit the flames. Yeah, if I could, like, uh get some 3D printed little fire bits and have the ground around them still be like on fire a little bit. Yeah. That'd be cool. Yeah, and then um, then switch to the sand for the units that don't have the flames around them. In fact, what you could probably even do is build up the texture paste up to the flame and then have it so it looks like it's actually coming from the ground and heating the ground around it. So the question was asked if I had the gin. The gin don't release till the end of the month, so I'll probably, if Parabellum decides to send those alongside the Rakshasa, that'll probably come the end of the month. Um, when I see Agent Dex referred to them as gin, and that's, I mean, a freet, as far as I know, they're basically a type of gin. They're like a, I don't know, would you call it a cousin to the gin? in traditional, like, lores. I don't know mm -hmm. about Conquest's lore specifically, but... So when, when we say Jin or Genies, we're kind of referring to both of them together. Because honestly, yeah. in, my, in my opinion, these are the ones that look more like what I envision when I think of a Genie. But I could be weird. I mean, I know I'm weird. That's not a question. <laughs> <laughs> But, yeah, and, and, like, even for their unreleased models and the direction they're going to go there, I'm going to be curious to see if they're going to continue this current theme or if we're going to see some, like, completely different models come out. I look forward to seeing what they do with the water and earth mm -hmm. uh, detachments of the army. They said that they would, they do have plans to do them, and I think the way it's going to play out is, uh, you know how, like, they've done a few surprise units where... It's not in the rule book, but they, they designed it as, you know, a founder's exclusive or whatever, and then they're like, mm -hmm. oh, let's give it rules. I think that's what we're going to see with the earth and fire, or not earth and fire, earth and water, um, where they're just going to be like, well, let's pump out a surprise unit and mix up the meta a little bit. Because mm -hmm. uh, Daryl indicated that it was not going to be... So I was saying we probably got two years before we see more expansions for the army. But Daryl was saying he he didn't expect it to be that long. So I would say maybe next year we could see them start pumping out stuff for the other sub-factions. I'm excited for the Earth in particular. I, I'm hoping they go like some big Earth elementals, big stone golems or something. I think that would be really cool. Well, and slowly but surely we're also seeing all of these rosters get filled up. And so there's going to be two fun things happening. We're either going to see completely new units, like you said, that we haven't even heard of. And or um, when an army's fully released, uh, we might see a faster turnout for the new armies. Yeah, where well, they, where they're able to focus on one more or even doing like um, new casts of old units and things like that. So I asked this in the, uh, the happy hour last week. I asked if um, like what was going to happen when an army is fully released. I asked whether they were going to just release a whole new, you know, army list with the next two years worth of releases or whatever. And what Daryl said was, like, they're probably going to do a bit of a hybrid where the, they won't go quite as far in advance with the releases. So they might give, like, here's what's going to come out for this army this year. Mm -hmm. And then maybe there will occasionally be a improvised unit added to the armies. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's kind of fun. 
And if you heard it from Daryl, that's a pretty reliable source. Usually, and whenever you hear stuff like that from the happy hour, where it's not like part of their official announcement, but it's like their on-the-spot answer to a question, always take it with like a grain of salt, because you can only see so far into the future, mm -hmm. and that that's true for Parbellum. They, they have their plan, but plans change. Yes. You know, like the... Uh, the Hellbringer Drake for the Dwegom is the perfect example. It was, uh, they had it finished. Like, they had the model on display in 2020 when I first discovered the game. They had it on display. They had the, uh, not the sprues, but they had the model there built at, uh, at Gamma, which is where I ran into them. And it was another, it was probably almost another year and a half to two years before they actually got the model released. Because they just kept having production delays and design stuff that needed to be fixed on it. Ooh, that's a good question. Yep, in theory, what's the next release so, faction? Parabellum's been really quiet about this. They're really not planning to release any information. In fact, even for the playtesters, it sounds like we probably won't know until about the same time that everybody else knows. They're going to do most of the playtesting for the next army internally. But at LVO, it seemed like there were two factions that were in the runnings. Because the next one's Parabellum Choice. It's not a Community Choice one. Mm -hmm. um, it sounded to me like the two options that are being considered the most seriously are the Weaver Courts. And the second most considered one is an army that hasn't been named yet. But if you saw the organized play kit from uh, this year, there's that kind of Chinese-looking character. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've yeah. seen that. So Parabellum, they, they told us, um, Stavro told us at LVO, that the only reason that army hasn't been announced yet is because the names of it were copyrighted already by some other video game or some other company somewhere had copyrighted the names. Mm -hmm. And so they're having to come up with new names and kind of adjust the lore for the army a bit. But it sounds like it's an army that they've actually been putting quite a bit of work into. And the the one I've seen from that tournament kit, that uh, Chinese character, if any model, he looks similar to the ones that we had here, the ones with the round shield. Yeah. Um, as far as, like, uh, stature and proportions. But he's, he's still a little bigger. But And it was like a concept model. It was more of kind of like a little teaser model you could end up with. But I'm torn about which one I would rather see. So, like... Personally, Weaver Courts don't interest me as a faction. I, I say that about a lot of factions, and then I end up getting them, and I love them. But uh, I also, but I want that even though I'm not as interested in the army personally, I want it to release because I know there are a lot of people that have been waiting for, you know, um, three years now. And from the the Weaver Court model that was in the tournament pack i i actually managed to win one of those down in utah um i could say i think it's going to be a little more of an elegant looking army i think that's where you're going to see a lot more of that it's, aesthetic but. it's weird to say but it's an army that i mean depending on how the execution of the art style goes mm -hmm. it's an army that strikes me as being one of those ones that's going to be really appealing to uh the female war gamers not not exclusively no but like kind of like how the old dominion i find that most female war gamers that play Conquest that I've met play Old... or Wadroon. Did mm -hmm. I say Old Dominion? I meant to say Wadroon. Yeah, Wadroon. Wadroon. Because they like the dinosaurs and something about... I know, like, my wife, anything that has lots of big creatures in it, she tends to get all excited about. Um, but I think as far as a faction that you would say embodies, like, more of an elven theme, I think it would be Weaver Courts. They, they yeah. might have a bit more of a Wood Elf fill versus the Spires. But, but they're also going to have the kind of Dark Elf aspect in the uh, the Insect Courts, which are going to be pretty terrifying looking based yeah. off of descriptions I've heard of them. And if the lore expands, I'm kind of hoping there is a little bit more of a darker side to them, because right now some of the lore makes them sound a little more good, like they're trying to blend with nature rather than harness it and all, but it's like, how far does that go? Yeah. <laughs> I would love to see... The two factions that are... I guess there's like three factions that I really want to see released. Mm -hmm. That's their... Whatever this Chinese faction turns into. Because I've never really... <clears throat> never really seen a game execute a Chinese faction in a way that has made me be like, Oh, I want to get into that. Yep. And then uh, I want to see Hell released. Um, I probably won't get the army for myself, but my wife, the moment she heard it was going to be like Wyverns and Drakes and stuff, 
Yep. She was all excited for that. Um, and then Famine. Famine sounds really, really cool. They've said it's going to be like a Creatures of the Deep kind of Cthulhu-esque yeah, army. Yeah. And fish gnomes, you know. <laughs> yeah, going to be fish gnomes. <laughs> They've never said there's going to be fish gnomes, but <laughs> right. we all know it's going to be know. there. <laughs> Maybe that's part of the, you know, one of these unannounced armies they're playtesting internally. Um, but the only other one I know of would be uh, Dogs of War is another faction we've heard rumored. And that was actually part of Project 8. Um, Project 7, that was between City States and what was the other option? Old Dominion and, and uh, Weavers. Weavers. So Weavers, have, they've been patiently waiting. And I, I, eventually they're coming. I know there's been a lot of hype for them, but I think the reason, like, they've been mentioned a few times. So I think that's why people are waiting for them. But I also know that they are picky with their models. So if they're not happy with how they look or how the artwork is, they're not going to release them. Yeah. Well, and I know the uh, the artist that originally created the concept art for the Weaver Courts uh, left the company for a while. I've heard that he's back, maybe, possibly. They've been kind of quiet about that as well. They, Parabellum's trying to be quiet about their next army because I think they learned from the Weaver Courts that if you give people too much information to be excited about mm -hmm. and then you don't get that army out fast, people kind of get impatient and they start to get a little bit upset even. Yep. Uh, so I saw here where they're um, mentioning the Weaver Courts kind of being similar to Sorcerer Kings with like the elemental uh, theme. And... You know, like I said, since it's an unreleased army, we don't know a ton about the lore. Um, all that we know confirmed is that they're like a, an offshoot of the Spires. And they're, you know, just like the Spires, they're harnessing what's around them. They're, they're, you're, you're using it for what they need it for. There's a lot of potential to do crazy things with their gameplay because they. we already know some of the sub-factions. Like, there's going to be the insect courts, which are going to be more bug-themed, you know, very terrifying-looking models. There's going to be more of the like woodland courts that are going to be more like, mm -hmm. you know, merged with trees, merged with deer, whatever. Um, and those are going to be very that kind of wood elfy theme. I think there's, uh, kind of like the Spires, they probably won't be doing like, they won't be doing the same kind of stuff because they're not doing like pheromancies and stuff, but there'll be a lot more life magic, so a lot more of the biomancy, but mm -hmm. not corrupted in the way the Spires have done it. Yeah, and, and I've wondered about the idea of that going... So, for example, current spires, they use it too far in, like, kind of the dark way. You know, they're, they're making these weird abominable creatures and using it for what they need, and it's something that used to be beautiful is now corrupted. And I'm wondering if the Weaver Courts would be kind of the opposite end of that spectrum, where they're going too far with the life binding. Um, because both of them are supposed to come from the same concept, where it was a balance between the two. Yeah. Um, so I'm wondering if it's going to see these two trains of thoughts that well, have evolved into what we see today. Mechanically, I could see some potential to do some fun stuff like... Imagine one of your your spells for one of your spellcasters is like pick a unit and modify them with some nature aspect. Mm -hmm. You know, cast a thing on them that makes them sprout out sprout antlers, and now they're you know yeah. charging in with a better charge or something. Yep. Who knows? Or something's happened and they've become too fused with whatever you know, whatever it is, and it's kind of like warped their perception. So that could be a cool brute unit, but. Nope. Um, I think that the Cthulhu-themed army could be fun, just because I'd be curious to see what they do model-wise. I've heard that Parabellum has something like 20 to 25 armies planned, like they've got lore <laughs> written for them, and they just aren't going to... They're not going to just throw it all at us, because then we'll be waiting 20 years to get all the factions. <laughs> know, but right. They've got a, a long, a long uh, roadmap planned. And then at Adepticon, or not Adepticon, at LVO, I got talking with Stavro about other game concepts they had. And that was an interesting co uh, conversation. I don't know how much they want that being known, so we're not, I'm not going to talk about it, but I do know there are like something like five other games that they're looking mm -hmm. at. Well, and like you said, I, like, I won't give details of what he was saying, just because I don't know if it's stuff that he's going to move on in the future or not. But it was fun just to... Uh, talk to him kind of on that personal level where it's like, you know, these are the things that he's imagined and these are the kind of the dreams he's had for the company and directions he would go. Well, I think we're kind of, we're hitting a point where it's probably time to start wrapping this up. We've been not quite two hours on the stream, but we finished building the models and 
we could ramble on and on forever. Oh yeah. Um, but one thing I will say is, um, uh, as the comments kind of dwindle out from here on, if you guys want to leave comments for anything you'd be interested in seeing in the future, um, just any, like, if there's any particular model you would like to see us build and review, or um, maybe even some discussion on, like, terrain here, or anything like that, just let us know. Yeah. And uh, we would be happy to have that feedback and move that direction. Yeah, and at a glance, it seems like these uh, this format of live streaming seems like it's received pretty well. Like, I think we've had the best engagement in the chat that we've ever had in a stream. So if you guys would like to see, like, just streams where we sit and paint and talk, we could do that. Um, even if we don't finish a model from start to finish, I wouldn't be opposed to sitting and painting for a few hours and mm -hmm. just kind of talking theories. And But if that's something you guys would be interested in watching, let us know so that we can plan for that. Um, our next stream will probably be, honestly, it's probably going to be a couple weeks, just because next week we have a convention that we have to go take care of, and uh, maybe the week after that could be our next streamed game. I don't think I'll have enough city-states, or not city-states, Sorcerer Kings put together to play them yet, but maybe. Either way... Um, let us know what you guys are interested in. We want to create more and more content for you. And it doesn't even have to be live streams. If you've got, you know, full-length videos that you'd like to see, paint tutorials or specific techniques, just let us know. Um, and then also consider joining our Discord server for our community Discord. The link is in the description of this live stream. But uh, you can talk with me and with Caleb and with everybody else whenever you want in that Discord. But uh, thank you guys for watching today. Have a great night.